the kindling, the material that is burst into flame in Syria or Egypt or Libya or Tunisia, they're all different cases. But the spark that went from one to the other was common. Hi, I'm Matt Welch here in Las Vegas, Nevada at the Freedom Fest conference. And I'm joined this morning with Tom Palmer, the executive something or other at the Atlas Network. He also works with Cato. Tell us a little bit for the people who don't know about the Atlas Network, what does it do? The Atlas Economic Research Foundation, also known as the atlasnetwork.org, works with about 400 think tanks worldwide and helping people to found them, bringing together the various constituents, scholars, journalists, students, business people to promote liberty in their particular country or context and uh, helping them to run them as businesses. We work with dreamers and idealists and thinkers, and then we have to say, well, at the same time, a think tank is a business. You need good accounting, good governance, transparency, measurements of effectiveness. That's the sort of work we do. So you're interested in freedom in a global context. Uh, I think in many ways, the most interesting story in 2011 is what's happening in the Arab Middle East and North Africa. A lot of different kind of takes on that. What does it mean? Is it a sort of liberal movement at heart? Is it a uh, kind of Muslim nationalism uh, counter reaction? Give us kind of a big periscope uh, picture, your assessment of what that is, how you know, should we feel enthusiastic or optimistic about it? What do you think? I'm modestly optimistic. I think good things are likely to come of this, but obviously it's a complicated case. A few things to be kept in mind. Every country is different. So the kindling, the material that is burst into flame in Syria or Egypt or Libya or Tunisia, they're all different cases. But the spark that went from one to the other was common. And it started on December 16th of last year. A young man named Tarek Al Taib Mohammed Bouazizi did something very simple. He borrowed $200 to be able to buy fruits and vegetables for his stand the next morning to be able to go out and do business, trying to make a living. Uh, at about 10.30 the next morning, he was assaulted by the local police and a government official. They said he didn't have a license. They overturned his vegetable cart. They destroyed his produce. Uh, he was slapped publicly and humiliated. And they took his electronic scales. Just a little humiliation, having to live under this lawless kind of regime, which is the way most Arabs live, under unaccountable governments that are corrupt and brutal. And he went to the governor's office and he said, I want my scales back. I can't do business without being able to measure how much the customer is, is buying. And no one listened to him. No one looked at him. He was ignored. He went out into the street and he said, if you don't see me, I'll burn myself. An almost inconceivable act of protest. It's a horrible act of desperation. Bystanders said he went to the petrol station, got petrol, and before he lit himself on fire, he said, how is a man to make a living? And did this, this horrible act. It outraged people in Tunisia. That they said, we have to live like this. He died on January 4th. His sister, when talking to Reuters, said, imagine what would cause a man to do such a thing. We have no dignity. In our town, in the city of Bouzid, uh, if you don't have connections or money to pay bribes, you have no dignity in life. And this call for basic human dignity went from country to country. They said, we don't want to be ruled by autocrats who l are presidents for life and then appoint their sons to succeed them. It's been a movement of astonishing courage and bravery. In most countries, substantially nonviolent, at least on the part of the protesters, not the part on the government. And it has shown a demand for dignity. I think that is the most important element of this. The Islamists, the radical Islamists, were caught unawares, as were the autocrats. They, of course, then ran as fast as they could after a while to get in front of the parade to claim somehow they're leading it. But it didn't fool anyone. Certainly in Egypt, the big case that people have focused on, the Muslim Brotherhood was shocked and surprised. They were not initially supportive of it. They then came out in support of it, but they're fracturing. Now they're breaking apart into different factions, some of which are more friendly to the classical liberal values and some of whom are adamantly opposed. I think it's a healthy thing that they're breaking up. As to what's going to happen, it's hard to say, and each country is unique. Egypt is the big one, if you will, and there you have many different players, most notably the military, who own maybe 20% of the economy. 
military socialism, and they will fight to retain their privilege. The forces of liberty are very active. We work with them, really brave and courageous people in each country. And part of my job is to enable them to work with their other friends around the world. Uh, we have a project, minbaralhuriya.org, the Forum of Liberty in Arabic. Uh, we do programs all over the Arab world. Uh, this week we have a seminar in Morocco in Arabic, a summer school on freedom. We'll do one in Egypt. And we're really ramping up uh, with our partners in the Arab world. So I'm excited and modestly optimistic. From your perspective, what is the proper either American U.S. foreign policy response to this or even like a, uh, an American way of thinking about it because the two are a little bit intertwined? I think that the wise approach in the U.S. government is to learn to shut up and keep their hands to themselves. They find it very difficult to do that. Even on the level of rhetoric, we had first uh, the Obama administration saying, well, we're behind Mubarak and we're for stability. And then, well, maybe he's being too harsh uh, and maybe, maybe things should change. And at the end, they claimed credit for the whole thing. We were behind it from the beginning, which of course discredited many of the people who had been promoting it to be portrayed by our Secretary of State as some kind of puppets of the U.S. This was really, uh, it was false and it was stupid they should learn to shut up. But as we know, politicians find this extremely difficult to just keep their mouths shut and keep their hands to themselves. I don't think that military intervention is wise in that situation. Let them sort these things out. From the perspective of Americans, we should try to do something that's hard to do. Imagine what it's like to be another person. It's one of the hardest human acts there is, but it's the foundation of libertarian values. What if I were that person? Would I like being treated like that? and to understand people who have lived under one-party dictatorship, state control of the media, like in Syria, what their life is like, what it is that they're trying to achieve. They don't hate us because we chew gum or drink alcohol, a small number do. The average person is generally pretty well disposed toward Americans. They resent our government's intervention into Middle Eastern affairs. This is undeniable that the U.S. is been very involved in the Middle East and so oftentimes in very unpopular ways. That's generally resented by most people, but they don't have a burning hatred of the United States. And also to try to understand Islam as a religion that has been caricatured as inherently violent. I'm not going to say it's true or false because I don't tell other people what their religions mean, but I know the vast majority of Muslims reject that and many Muslim libertarians actively work for religious freedom, for toleration and coexistence. Let's find our friends. They're the best friends we can have are the libertarians in Syria, in Jordan, Lebanon, Egypt, and other countries in the region, and work with them. Final question, the morality of capitalism, what your professor won't tell you. What is this about? What are you doing? Well, actually, it's a project with Atlas and the Students for Liberty, which is a great organization. Any students watching this should go to studentsforliberty.org. I'm a big fan. Uh, we are producing 100,000 copies of a book on the morality of capitalism. And it has chapters by business people, by scholars, chapters translated from Chinese and Russian. A high school student can read it. A PhD economist can read it. A business person can read it and get something out of it. What we want it to focus on is the, the moral foundation of a free market economy. It's morally good. It's just. People who make money honestly in the market don't have to pay back to society. That's why they're rich. They gave something to other people in a real free market, as opposed to cronyism, which unfortunately is the direction we're moving toward now, crony capitalism. That's great. Thank you very much, Tom Thank Palmer. You. For Reason TV, I'm Matt Welch.